Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ronald, and I am an alcoholic. Oh, I like the way that sounds. <laughs> First and foremost, I'd like to thank God for my life, just the way it is at this precise moment. And I always give thanks to the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous for being here for me, but more importantly, for being free. Uh, my life has been recreated, and it didn't cost me a dime. To everybody in there that's an old-timer or that was here when I got here, I'd like to humbly thank you and say thank you for everything, every argument, every fight, <laughs> or every cigarette butt you done stepped on or to keep the doors open for a drunk like me. Because if it hadn't been for you, I wouldn't be here now. I want to thank all the groups are right here in New Orleans. Uh, this is my second time ever in New Orleans. Uh, the first time I came here, I was with my sponsor, who is no longer alive. And I was also with uh, the late Clancy, uh, who is no longer alive. And uh, so when I saw that round of uh, the Copeland Hotel, it just brought back all those memories and things that them two uh, alcoholics had said to me. And I want to thank uh, my Queen Elizabeth and Kenny uh, for their uh, uh, for their hospitality. Uh, you know. Uh, but I think Kenny is a little nasty. I think I think he wanted some free time with his wife today, uh, so he. Uh, he fed me some red beans and rice that knocked me out. Uh, so I don't know what they was doing in the other room. Uh, but uh, uh, anyhow, I met a lot of you people uh, uh, through Jacobs. It's a wonderful thing for all of the, all of y'all uh, that has something against Zoom. I can't do no Zoom and all that. Okay, I respect uh, your beliefs, uh, but I'm here behind the virtual platform because that's where I met Jacobs. Uh, Jacobs has been with us almost every night for over a year and he's became our brother in L.A. and I became uh, his brother uh, in New Orleans. How the hell that happened? <laughs> uh, so I want to thank you, Jacobs, uh, because uh, when you and your husband uh, be on there, he be sitting there looking like a little, a little mannequin. Oh, uh, you know? Oh, uh, 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 yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, you made it possible for me to be here, and I love you for that. And now I just want to say this to every group or that just participated or in the neck breakers contest or by preparing the food, even though every group didn't walk away with the crown, each and every one of y'all was winners. Uh, because what I saw was here in New Orleans, the unity. That's what this is about, the unity. And it was fun. And I'm just saying that because I don't want to get beat up about <laughs> <laughs> not picking the right group. <laughs> okay, uh, let me start. Uh, remember, Kenny, I told you when I get down to five or ten minutes to give me a signal because uh, I don't know which way I'm finna go. <laughs> uh, but I told Kenny them last night or that I'm here in New Orleans for one reason and one reason only, and that's to stimulate the thoughts of one person and to place a smile on somebody's face. So out of all you people, I don't know who I'm going to reach tonight, uh, but I ask God that he let me uh, reach at least one person. Uh, so only you will know 
if what I have to say uh, can help you. Uh, one more time, my name is Ronald and I'm an alcoholic. Okay. I do have a sobriety date that I want to keep. My sobriety date is September the 13th, 1993, which means one day at a time, I've been sober for 28 years. Uh, now, to my new friends, it don't make me no better than you. It just makes me better than one person uh, in this building right now. It makes me better than who I was when I got here uh, 28 years ago. I'm not one that believes that the newcomer is the most important uh, person in any meeting that I attend. Uh, because outside coming in, I was the most important person. Or uh, then they get up here and they read these formats and they say, are there any other alcoholics present? And I say, yeah, right here. That's what makes us even. Uh, now, there's some people in this meeting right now that got more money than me. Their house is bigger than mine. They've been on their job longer than I have. Or uh, they got all one case. But in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, or that don't mean jack shit. I'm not going to ask you, can I borrow $5 in here, but I might get you at your car. <laughs> oh, now, uh, is it any newcomers in the room that's under a, a year sober? Oh, y'all here. Oh. I'd like to personally uh, welcome you uh, to the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, this message that I'm going to uh, bring right now is for you uh, under a year. I want you to hear me, and I want you to hear me closely, because I'm going to tell you something uh, that these other people ain't willing to tell you. <laughs> uh, see, uh, y'all keep coming to meetings. Are you going to hear these old timers in here talking about, oh, my life then got good. Uh, 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 my life is better now thanks to Alcoholics Anonymous. Oh, I got me a new car. Oh, man, I got me a house uh, because of, and I ain't one of them. <laughs> I'm going to tell you the truth. Uh, this damn program done messed my life up. <laughs> uh, this damn program done told my life up. Uh, see, before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was living in vacant houses, abandoned buildings. I didn't have no worries. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now I meet some people in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, now I'm a homeowner, and I got to pay mortgage. I got to pay light bill and gas bill. Uh, that's some bull. Oh, no. Uh, see, uh, before I got here, I walked everywhere uh, that I wanted to go. Uh, whether it was on Canal Street <laughs> or Bourbon Street, I walked and I stayed in shape. I was all healthy and everything. Uh, but then I meet you people in Alcoholics Anonymous and I end up with a car uh, with some big tail lights. Now I got to buy gas and get a oil chain. I get new tires and shit. Oh, that's some boom. I'm telling y'all, they done messed my life up. Before I got sober, I didn't know what none of my kids was at. <laughs> didn't even care. Oh, now I meet two people in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I done got to reacquainted with these strangers. And they be picking up the phone saying, hey, Dad, can I borrow $40? Oh, they done messed my life up. Oh, man. Uh, but since I've been here, I just said, I just roll with the punches. I uh, saw so all of y'all that raised y'all hands at newcomers. Uh, look around at all these damn losers. <laughs> Uh, so, but if you still like going to jail, or uh, you still like uh, eating uh, uh, stuff that other people threw away, then this might not be the program for you. And I'm just telling you the truth. Uh, but if you want to change, uh, you might as well do like some of us. Uh, grab your ass a cup of coffee, uh, sit down, 
and try to find out what's in this ugly ass book right here. <laughs> okay, let me see where I'm going to start at. Prior to getting Alcoholics Anonymous, I had lost everything. And when you hear me say that I lost everything, I'm not talking about the money, the cars, a place to stay. I'm talking about I lost the stuff that you can't even put a name on. Well, I haven't been able to put a name on it uh, in 28 years. I uh, see somebody in here going to relate uh, to me when I say this. I lost that stuff that I once had that gave me the ability uh, to love, honor, and respect my own mother. I lost that stuff that I once had that gave me the ability to love, honor, and respect my own father. Uh, you know that stuff that I once had about me being the firstborn, me being the oldest child, me being the oldest grandchild, me being the oldest nephew, me being the protector of my brother and sister? I lost that stuff. I don't know what you called it, Kenny, but it was gone. But I can tell you this. Uh, thanks to Alcoholics Anonymous, it's been replaced. Somebody know what I'm talking about. See, I know it's one person in this room right now. Your mama done said, don't call this house no more. I uh, see it's a person in this room right now. Your sister or your brother don't want nothing to do with it. It's a person in this room. Kids hate the hell out of you. But what I like to share with you, whoever you are, keep coming back. Get into the program of recovery and let God fix the pieces of your puzzle. That's what has happened to me. Prior to getting Alcoholics Anonymous, I was living, not living, but I was existing in what they call a shooting gallery. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. All my friends was intravenous drug users and alcoholics. I never shot dope in my life, but had I not been rescued, uh, that was the next step because I had started buying them balloons uh, tooting every now and then, and I thank God that I didn't end up uh, with a stomach jones uh, so I could start identifying as something else. I was sleeping in these abandoned houses. I was even sleeping in front of our neighborhood gym. And the reason I'm sharing this is because I want to show you how far down the scale I went. Or just because you came in with a car, or you still had your job, your insurance company or paid for you to go to a program, or you didn't lose nothing, I don't think that you're different. You just stopped in time. And matter of fact, uh, it's a page in this book right here that doesn't even have a page number, but it has a title. It says they stopped in time. And what it asks is, if you listen to people like me and countless others uh, that have went uh, way down the scale, uh, we can help uh, save you years of pain and infinite suffering. You don't have to go as far down the scale as some of us went. I'm not going to stand here and tell you that a relapse or have to be a part of your recovery. Uh, because it don't. It don't say that nowhere in this book. Uh, but if you're back from a relapse, I'd like to welcome you. And I'd like to say, I hope that ass whooping made you a convincer. <laughs> I've been coming to meetings long enough to hear people get behind one of these and they say uh, some, of the, uh, 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 some of the things that I don't agree with are like, remember your last run because your last run is probably your worst run. 
stay sober long enough to look at some other runs, and you may be able to see where you should have stopped way back then. I know that's what has happened for me. My last run, when nobody shooting at me, police wasn't chasing me. The Hispanics wasn't running down the alley with bumper jacks calling me a mayate. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I didn't know what that meant until I got sober. <laughs> oh, yeah, you can't call me that now. <laughs> Uh, but uh, let me just start with my last run. On my last run, I was real comfortable. I was physically sitting on a curve. I had a bottle of, uh, with some alcohol in it. I had a pocket full of those cigarette lighters with no tops. <laughs> oh, y'all know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I had some of that other stuff we don't talk about in alcoholics and nuns. And I was comfortable. Wasn't messing with nobody and wasn't nobody uh, messing with me. One of my real friends, lifelong friend, he was on the opposite side of the street and he was walking towards me. Uh, so I was standing there, and I was staring at him. It was about 4.30 in the morning. He was on his way to work, going to the train station. Uh, he was staring at me, and I was staring back at him. Uh, then when he got directly across the street from me, he stopped, he turned, and he faced me. And we just had a stare off. But if I was able to read his mind, he probably was having thoughts like, look at my friend over there. Look at my big brother. He's pathetic. He's pitiful. He let that stuff beat him down. He's no good. Some of y'all have been told stuff like that. But I'm sharing my story. You know what I'm talking about, Q? I'm sharing my story. Uh, then he began to shake his head left to right from side to side. And he turned and he continued his journey. Something happened to my life at that precise moment. And I didn't understand what happened to my life until I became an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous. What actually happened to my life at that moment was I had a moment of clarity. Uh, to my new friends, all of y'all that raised your hand, uh, that's the word you're going to be hearing around here, a moment of clarity. I don't do big book studies from the podium, which I can, but I don't. Uh, but I help you newcomers to understand this one. What is a moment of clarity? I never heard that before. A moment of clarity is nothing but some sane thinking, uh, some clear thinking. And I remember I used to have a life. I used to take plane rides. I used to go to Disneyland. I used to uh, be able to be with my family. I used to be a father. It was all coming back to me in one hundred tenth of a second. Then a question was asked to me. And I like to say years later uh, that it was God rearranging my thoughts. Because the first question that popped up was, man, you used to go to the movies every week. What happened? And I didn't have an answer. Man, your mother used to be proud to tell the world that she was her firstborn. Now she done put a chain and a lock around her fence to keep you off of her property. What happened? I didn't have an answer. Man, your father, he swore up and down. 
uh, to all his co-workers and your uncles that he was going to make sure you had a life better than his uh, growing up in Shreveport, Louisiana. Now when he hears you in the neighborhood, he stands on the porch with his pistol. What happened? And I didn't have an answer. I looked over to my right, and there was a church catacorner. I looked at the church. Uh, then I looked up and saw the steeple on the church. Uh, then I looked a little higher, and I saw a cross. And I don't know what happened, but I do know I did this. Knocked over the bottle of alcohol. I took that other stuff out my mouth. Emptied my pocket of all the paraphernalia. And I got up and I stood in the intersection. And I looked at the sky. And I said the most sincere prayer that I've ever said in my life. Drunk or sober. And that prayer was, if there is an MF in God, then please help me. God wasn't so concerned with the profanity. Uh, he felt the sincerity of my heart. I got sober uh, right uh, when the cell phones was coming out. But some of you older people, you remember this one right here. Before we had a cell phone with the contact list and all that, uh, we had them little paper telephone books with all the rubber bands around them. Uh, we had the memorized numbers, uh, your mama number, the work number, grandma number, the next door neighbor number. We had to have that stuff memorized. We couldn't run in the house. Oh, I forgot my phone. Oh, no. Uh, so at that precise moment, God allowed me to remember a phone number. And I called this lady. And when she answers the phone, I said, I might need some help. I think I have a problem. Uh, now, in my home group, we had our oldest old time to die uh, recently. But one of his signature lines was, You'll never get into the solution if you don't know what the problem is. That's why I said, I think I have a problem because I didn't know what my problem was. I thought I was just having a streak of bad luck. <laughs> Some of y'all too, it's going to get better as soon as I get my next check. As soon as I hit the lottery, I'm going to buy a Jacob or Volkswagen, and I'm going to be all right. <laughs> uh, some of y'all done said some stuff like that. Because uh, I done said some silly stuff. Watch well, this one right here. Uh, it was a period during my drinking career. I don't know if it was depression or what. Uh, but I used to start crying. I'm talking about that heavy cry that you can't stop. <laughs> and then it was followed by this. <laughs> if I was white or with blonde hair and blue eyes, I wouldn't even be like this. <laughs> uh, but then looking around this meeting, I know that was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, uh, now I wonder if one of y'all was getting loaded and you started crying saying I wouldn't even be like this if I was black with a jelly girl <laughs> uh, see that disease uh, it'll make us believe anything Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, Lord, I used to be crying, too. Oh, yeah, but we know that ain't right. Oh, but you know what? I drank myself into oblivion until I made that phone call. Oh, this lady told me, she said, her name is Kathy. I'm not going to say this lady, Kathy. Uh, Kathy said, 
It's a meeting right down the street from where you are now. Why don't you walk to that meeting? It's going to be somebody at the back door. They're going to greet you. Somebody going to give you some cookies. Somebody going to give you a cup of coffee. Or you going to end up with some other people that's just like you. Or they going to understand. I don't know why. My first time ever to a meeting. Knowing anything about recovery. I didn't know nothing about programs and all that. I go to jail. Then they send me to prison. I don't touch nothing in prison. Because everything that runs us into this fellowship I can't be found inside of a prison. But I go to prison and don't touch nothing. It's the day that I get out. Then I start this cycle all over again. By the time I make it back to L.A., I'm off and running. Oh, but what she said was, I just gone up to the meeting. And that night I went up to the meeting. Nobody gave me a hug at the back door. Nobody gave me a cookie. <laughs> Nobody fixed me a cup of coffee. So that was the first lie uh, that I heard in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> uh, but God wasn't finished with me. Uh, because God allowed me to walk through the middle and sit in the very first seat in my very first meeting ever. Uh, they was reading all the formats like y'all do. And the only thing that I can think about sitting in that chair was, man, they got me in there with the damn police. I got to get up out of here. <laughs> uh, then they introduced the speaker like y'all did tonight. And everybody got to clap. And it took every ounce of energy in my body to turn around and try to understand what they was clapping for. And I saw a man walking down the aisleway. Uh, he had on a gray silk suit, a gray silk shirt. Uh, he had a clean shave. Uh, he had a haircut. And when he passed by me, he smelt like he had a wallet full of money. <laughs> oh, y'all know what that smell like. <laughs> oh, y'all done stole some money out of the strangest places. <laughs> oh, the man got up here and he started speaking. And what I heard in my very first meeting was his mother didn't want nothing to do with him, just like mine. He hadn't been on a job in a very long time, just like me. He couldn't stay out of them penitentiaries, just like me. But somewhere in his sharing, it flipped. Now he was taking care of his elderly mother. Now he had been on his job for years at a time. Now he hadn't returned to prison uh, for a long time. And my very first question sitting in my very first meeting was, how did he do that? How? So it was after the meeting. That's why it was so great seeing all y'all fellowship out there. Because there's somebody in this meeting right now. Uh, they are emotionally unstable. They're going through something and they don't want to open up and tell nobody. Uh, but you don't know what you did to them uh, just by giving them a hug outside. If somebody in there tonight came up here to eat some neck bones and stuff because they ain't got no food at home, but they too shy or they full of pride where they can't tell you. And it might just be me. After the meeting, a lot of these men's in the meeting made a circle around me. Or they can tell uh, that I just walked in with the clothes on my back. I didn't have nothing else. I carried a, a little duffel bag with my life savings in it. And for the life of me, I can't tell you what was in that bag. Uh, but I know if you'd have grabbed it, I'd have killed you. Because <laughs> uh, it was mine. 
And they started 12-stepping me. I now know that they was 12-stepping me. They was telling me what they did. Uh, they never told me what I got to do. They never said, if you don't do what I did, you're going to get loaded. Uh, they kept the uh, focus on themselves. And then one dude, uh, Steve E., uh, kept saying, he's one of us. Now I remember I'm a gangbanger from Los Angeles, and I take the stance weighing 169 pounds. I ain't one of y'all. Uh, you ain't from my hood. <laughs> Why is it, my new friends, that I want to be argumentative and combative uh, with the old timers in here that's trying to help me save my life? But out there, uh, you can tell me to try this, and I don't question it at all. Oh, that's like people be telling me, oh, man, I don't know what's in it. Oh, man, I ain't never knew what was in anything, and I was taken. Oh, shit, all of a sudden, you want to be a scientist. <laughs> shit. I don't even know what was in them damn neck bones out there. Oh, but, oh, but I tell you one thing, oh, whatever they dropped in that number one neck bone, it got me. <laughs> Or now if I can't sleep tonight, or what group was that? The Big Easy? I'll be back. Yeah. <laughs> After these men got the 12 step, one of them asked me, would I be willing to go to a program? And I don't know why, but I said yes. They made the phone call, they arranged it. I ended up in a program. The program reintroduced me to Alcoholics Anonymous. On my 13th day in the program, I was introduced to the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And what I used to do was sit down and read the personal stories in the back. Now, you don't have to necessarily jump to the steps, first step, second step, third step, and all that. We start off by reading some of the personal stories in the back. There's 44 of them. Or then, or don't be or so judgmental and say, I didn't do that. Try to find the stuff that you did do, that you can relate to. Well, I did something similar to that. You understand what I'm saying? If it makes sense, do that make sense? Okay. So I started going to meetings uh, because that was part of our program. I didn't wait five years, Elizabeth. I didn't wait seven years to ask somebody for some help. 38 days in this program, I asked the lady, could you help me find a sponsor? Uh, she said, I know who'd be good for you. Uh, she carried me uh, by my hand uh, to this man, uh, Leon Strange. Uh, to me, had become one of the greatest men on earth. And I asked him, did he sponsor people? And he told me he would be willing to work with me. Uh, he told me to get what I can get from the treatment program. Because once I come up out of there, he was going to introduce me to the program of recovery as outlined in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And me standing here uh, right now in New Orleans, Louisiana, I know it's a difference. All program I did for me was really I gave me a safe haven that separated me from alcohol and other things and put me in a more disciplined environment. Uh, see, I'm not going to be one of them that's going to come all the way to New Orleans and tell y'all I ain't did nothing. It's been all God. If that was the case, it wouldn't be a such thing as relapse. No, it's been God along with my cooperation that has kept me here. Relapse. I used to couldn't understand why a person could get this gift of recovery and then all of a sudden I give it back. But now I'm clear. If this program is to get you in touch uh, with a creative intelligence, a spirit of the universe, a higher power, a God that can give you the power for the first time in your life to say, no, thank you, but I'm just not drinking today. And then you get connected to that power 
and then you think that you got it going on, you think you running the show, and you start uh, forgetting about that power, you get disconnected, or what happened? Or your ass go back out. I remember one time, it was a guy, Q, listen at me now, it was a guy, uh, he did like this, he said, Man, it sure feel good to be clean and sober all these years. Uh, then there was a guy standing next to him. He said, yeah, man, I know what you mean. I ain't found it necessary to go out. And the guy over here looked at him, scratched his head. He said, oh, man, I saw you drunk last night. <laughs> I see you taking some pills. Or you were smoking some of that stuff the other day. I then the dude over here did like this. He said, uh, yeah, but it wasn't necessary. <laughs> <laughs> I see it's a lot of young people in here too. Let me give y'all some. Uh, I'm not breaking tradition, so you old timers, hold on to your seat. I'm talking to the youngsters now. <laughs> Stop fighting with whether you're an addict or an alcoholic. I did that uh, when I was new. Some of y'all uh, will say, I can drink it, put it down. That's not what makes us an alcoholic. That's not what makes me an alcoholic. What makes me an alcoholic is that I lose the ability uh, to enjoy and control. Uh, yeah, I might open up a drink. i take a sip and then go to that other stuff. Because see, some of y'all came in here off of crystal meth. Are you face pickers? Um, <laughs> Uh, y'all was on them zanny balls. Uh, y'all was uh, messing around with the ecstasy. Uh, y'all had all that other stuff that's out there. You think, oh, I keep my ear to the street? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, see, if you take a sip, and uh, then you run over here and get all that stuff, uh, then you run back at the end of the night because ain't nothing left but that hot-ass alcohol. <laughs> Oh, that's something you may need to look at. Because, oh, see, that's what makes me an alcoholic. I lose the ability uh, to enjoy uh, and control. It's not what color it is that I drink. It's not how many proofs it is uh, uh, that I drink. It's not um, uh, how long I drink. It's what happens to me. I put the drink down and I go to the other stuff. That's what makes me an alcoholic. Because, see, if I don't pick the drink up, uh, guess what? I'm not chewing on no mushrooms. <laughs> I don't pick the drink up, I won't be digging in my face. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense? Okay, somebody said it makes sense. <laughs> oh, yeah. So stop, uh, uh, stop fighting with uh, when they ask you the question. Uh, if you standing on the train tracks, uh, uh, you get hit by a train, was it the engine or the caboose that killed you? I hope I got over to somebody to help them see that. I got into uh, this program, and uh, they started taking us to meetings, and after 38 days, I asked the man to be my sponsor, and he became my sponsor. On my 13th day, September the 25th, 1993, I was presented with my big book. I started off reading the stories. Uh, then when I started working with my sponsor, uh, my sponsor didn't give me a book and say, I'm going to read the doctor's opinion and come back and uh, tell me about it. No, uh, my sponsor opened up his book, I opened up my book, and I began to read. Uh, then the words that I didn't know or I thought I knew, he had me look them up in the dictionary, and I was amazed. Uh, look at this right here, Kenny. Uh, he said, uh, 
Read this, I say, the results were nil until we let go absolutely. Oh, <laughs> uh, he say, do you know what nil means? I say, yeah, that's my homeboy. He got busted uh, uh, transporting cocaine. Uh, uh, he say, no, nah, get the dictionary, man. Uh, so I looked up that little three-letter word, N-I-L, and the definition was nothing. So now when I'm sitting in a meeting and I hear somebody read that, the results were nil. What they saying is the results are nothing. That kind of stuff blew me away. So that's why it's good to have a dictionary with your big book. Stop skipping over words you really don't know the meaning of because it can take that whole paragraph out of context. So I ended up going through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, going through the steps in order, not off the wall, but through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it was in step one uh, that I finally began to get some answers of why I couldn't stop once I got started. In the 12 and 12, it says there's only one step that needs to be done perfectly, and that's step one. If you don't have step one down, uh, you may be on a shaky foundation. Uh, Once I found out why I couldn't stop once I got started, it had me on a momentum uh, where I wanted to go to step two or to be restored to sanity. But before I can be restored to sanity, I have to revisit some of them insane moments. Or you know, like some of y'all was like me, or you get loaded and you can't walk on the sidewalk, you got to walk in the street. That's some insane (laughs) shit. Fire trucks and ambulance and back of us with the sardine on, and we still not moving because we spook thinking something in the bushes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, this is what I want everybody to do I just take a moment to look at some of the people that you was getting loaded with in your last days did you really know them was they your really uh, your real good friends did you know they sister and brothers did you know they mamas some of y'all was getting loaded with total strangers that could have been a serial killer <laughs> think about it think about it oh, they had a serial killer in LA called the Grim Reaper or oh, you can look him up on Google worked for the police department killed over 200 women and then after he killed them he enjoyed taking pictures of them while they was dead they finally caught him through DNA. They uh, used the DNA on his family member and traced it back to him. And he was working at the police station right in our neighborhood. So you never know who you was getting loaded with. Could have been his nephew. <laughs> I be uh, in meetings and I hear people I say things like, I've been on step three for two years. Uh, my sponsor won't let me move forward. <laughs> step three ain't nothing but making a decision. <laughs> oh, that's all it is. Am I going to be willing to turn my life uh, and my will, my will and my thinking over to something outside of myself? Uh, because I don't know about you, but when I got in this program, I was invincible. I was God. Uh, because I said what I wanted to say. I did what I wanted to do. I, I went where I wanted to go. You couldn't tell me nothing. Uh, but now, I done learned so much in this program uh, that I became willing to believe in something outside of myself. Uh, watch this. Uh, my new friends that raised your hands. Uh, look how magical this program is. No matter what your family members called you, you damn drunk, are you scandalous, are you scallywag, are you tramp? That didn't really matter because you kept on getting loaded. But watch this. 
you end up in this wonderful program and they tell you to stand up as a newcomer and say your name. Hi, my name is Ronald and I'm an alcoholic. And I stopped drinking. How magical is that? How magical is that? I stand up in a room full of strangers in New Orleans and say, hi, my name is Ronald, and I'm an alcoholic. And next thing I know, I look up. I got 30 day, uh, 37 days sober. How does that happen? I'm not trying to figure it out. I just want to stay on the path. Because uh, there's somebody in this room that has more time than me. I just want to stay on the path. What happened to me? Okay, Kenny just gave me the 10-minute sign. I thought he was doing a New Orleans gangbanging sign. <laughs> <laughs> I was feeling like, I ain't going on with him. <laughs> uh, but let me just get this one out the way. Oh, I got 11 minutes. He's 18. I got 11. <laughs> I picked the neck bones, fool. I got as much time as I want. <laughs> oh, see, I, I done lost my train of thought. Oh, what I was, I was going to say a good one. Oh, no. Oh, let me pick something else. Then. Okay, I got 10 minutes left. Oh, let me share this. Since I've been sober, Oh, I know what I was about to say. Oh, here we go. But my, this is for the newcomers, my new friends. Are <laughs> oh, you going to be around here? Some people going to make the steps. I sound spooky and scary. Who don't do no four step? Who it make you feel this way? Who you don't really want to dig that deep? Yes, you do. <laughs> oh, yes, you do. Because oh, a four step ain't for nobody but you. I don't even know who Miss Jeffries is or when you're reading it off. Are you still holding on to some shit that uh, happened to you when you was in the third grade? Are <laughs> uh, them people ain't even thinking about you? Uh, but it's your deep, dark secret. Uh, let me show you. I remember when I got to the fourth step. Uh, that's, how you, uh, you, that's when you start writing. All right? Uh, so you start off, or uh, you be putting, I'm resentful at, I'm resentful at Kenny. Or uh, then you go to the next column, of uh, the cause, or uh, Kenny hit me in my eye. Or <laughs> uh, then you go to the next column, it affects my self-esteem, because uh, every time I see him, I feel real low. It affects my pride, because I'm thinking about what other people think about me. It affects Y'all with me? Then they come and they ask this dumbass question. <laughs> Ain't nobody ever asked me in my life, what part did you play in it? I didn't play no part. <laughs> and my sponsors say, so Kenny just walked up to you out of everybody on the face of the earth and hit you in your eye for nothing. <laughs> I say, a uh, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he said, oh, no, let's start from the beginning. What happened that day? Oh, well, see, uh, I was walking down the street, and I saw Kenny's door on his car unlocked. Uh, so I just opened up the door, and then I laid on his front seat uh, to make sure his stereo was wired correctly. <laughs> <laughs> But then I, I just heard somebody say, hey, what you doing? And when I turned around and stood up, it was Kenny. And he hit me in my eye. <laughs> oh, that's the kind of stuff I had to review of when I got here. But for years, I had been running around saying, I hate Kenny. Kenny hit me in my eye. But I edited out what I did. Just like most of y'all. Uh, this why it's good to get into the uh, steps of my new friends. Uh, because you can get to unleash what you think is a deep, dark secret. 
Uh, here go the deepest one I had right here. Stay with me, y'all. I had put all this stuff down. And then I got to this one. I, and this was the one I said, I'll never tell nobody on the face of the earth this. So I was sitting in the living room with my sponsor. And we was going through my resentment list. But then I get to the deepest, darkest secret. And he say, what's the matter? I say, I don't know how to tell you this. He say, with words. <laughs> I said, okay, I'm going to do it then. I'm going to get rid of it. Uh, you see, when I was younger, um, um, uh, when I was younger, um, um, you know, when I was, he said, okay, we know you was young. <laughs> I said, uh, when I was younger, I had a sex with a street. Uh, he said, what did you say? I said, when I was younger, I had sex with a street. <laughs> he said, man, take this off. Who or what did you have sex with? <laughs> Keep your hand from your mouth and let me hear you say it. <laughs> you talking to me and God right now, nobody else. So I said, when I was younger, I had sex with a chicken. Uh, he looked at me. <laughs> then he asked me this damn ass, dumb ass question. Did yours die too? <laughs> and the reason I share that to my new friends is because it's nothing. It's nothing up under the sun that's unique in Alcoholics Anonymous. I uh, saw. So, uh, can I give them one more candy? I give him one more. Uh, so you know how some people come to the podium and they say things like, Hi, my name is Ronald. Then another person that come up, Hi, my name is Ronald and I'm a real alcoholic. Y'all hear that, right? Uh, Y'all want to know the difference, my new friends? Uh, this is how you can tell the difference. Uh, this dude got off of work and he went to the bar and he told the bartender, Oh, you know my favorite drink. Let me get a drink. So the bartender made his drink, and he sat it on the table. Uh, the man looked inside of his drink. Uh, he said, hey, bartender, it's a fly in this drink. Uh, that was just a social drinker. Bartender get the cup, bring him back a fresh drink. Another man get off of work. Uh, he walk into a bar. I mean, let me give a double of what I drank. Uh, so when the bartender brought his cup and he sat it down, uh, that man saw a fly in his drink. Uh, so he just thumped it out. <laughs> and he drank. <laughs> now that's a hard drink. <laughs> uh, then this other man walked in the meeting. And he was tired. And he needed a drink. Uh, he said, bartender, uh, you know what I drank. Hook mine up. Uh, bring it to me quick. A uh, bartender bought him his drink. Uh, he looked in the cup and he saw the fly. And he just looked at him. Uh, he, I grabbed the fly and he started choking him saying, spit it out. Uh, spit it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now that's a real alcoholic. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say this in closing. I got two minutes left. Okay, I'm going to say this in closing. Uh, since I've been sober, I was retaught uh, to be fully self supporting through my own contributions, uh, which means. Uh, that I, I took the principle of Alcoholics Anonymous and I got a job. 
I went to school. I graduated from college. I walked across the stage of a university. I was able to re- I resigned from one job and get another job making more money. And then I was in the right place at the right time with God in my life. And I ended up uh, getting uh, uh, starting a career in the movie industry. I was behind the scenes. I worked on a lot of TV shows that some of y'all may have watched. And I worked on a lot of movies that some of y'all may have watched. But in September of 2016, I was happy as a lark. I don't even know what a lark is. I just heard that on the record. (laughs) Uh, But I was working on a movie, an Oscar award winning movie. And I walked through a door. I had to go in there to get a, a Gatorade. While I was in there, another department known as the Grips was building something right outside the door. And they laid down a whole lot of what we call speed rails. But in layman's turn, they laid down a lot of pipes. So when I turned around to come out the door, uh, my feet landed on the pipes. And they snatched my feet from under me so fast, I couldn't even break my fall. I landed on the back of my head. I wasn't knocked out, but I was dazed. They called the paramedics. The paramedics came. Uh, They checked me out. Paramedics wanted to take me to the hospital, and I refused. Little did we know that when I fell, I had ripped or ruptured the arteries in my neck. And I was walking around bleeding to death and didn't even know it. So when the blood finally started clotting up, a blood clot went to my brain. And in September of 2016, I had a massive stroke. I couldn't walk. I couldn't talk. I couldn't say the serenity prayer. I forgot what color the big book is. And I even forgot that God existed. So from September 2016 to January 2017, I had a total of four strokes. And it was on the third stroke that they finally figured out what was causing it. So for the past five years, I done been bedridden. I done been confined to a wheelchair. I done been on a walker. I done been on crutches. I threw the crutches down because I got tired of tripping over them. For the people that know me, uh, they know this is not my normal rate of speech. I'm straining the talk, but you ain't going to shut me up. Oh, hell no, you ain't going to stop me. I'm finally uh, walking more better. Uh, But I was telling Kenny last night, uh, there was a time you could throw 50 pennies on the ground. And you say, step on that one and step on that one and step on it. And I couldn't do it. Five years later, it's just now starting to happen. The reason I say this at the end of my uh, story is uh, because I got a feeling uh, that somebody in here need to be reminded of what a miracle is. And I'm going to say this in closing. If you are the one that needs to be reminded of what a miracle is, uh, this is my suggestion. Uh, when you get home tonight, go in the bathroom Get your washcloth. Wash your face like you. I haven't washed your face in a long time. And then after you cleanse your face, I stand there and just stare in the mirror and look into your eyes, look into the windows of your soul. And you just might see what I see looking back at me because you all look like miracles. Because nobody in this room look like what they've been through. Thanks for letting me share.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.